In this video, we continue our discussion of probability, but now we'll talk about what happens if you make multiple selections of the same thing in a row, or different selections even. Here's a clue, multiply. Let's get started. So the fundamental counting principle, or known as the FCP, is technically the fancy way we say that to calculate the number of ways to make multiple selections from various categories, whether they're the same or different, also known as the number of points in your sample space, that's the official definition if you're going to take a statistics course, you'll hear about that, you would simply need to multiply the number of choices for every selection together. Now each selection here is called an event. So for example, it could be a situation where the event is you're picking an outfit from your closet, your wardrobe selection, and you need to pick one top, one bottom, maybe one accessory, and maybe some shoes, right? And so you have to say, well, how many different tops do I have? How many different bottoms do I have? Shorts, pants, skirts, whatever. How many different shoes do I have? How many different purses do I have? Multiply the number of possibilities for each selection together, and there we have the total number of possible outcomes in our sample space. So let's take a look at an easier case. Suppose you are selecting an entree, in this example here, and a side dish. So you have a limited menu, and the menu, maybe this is for a holiday, they tell you you can only choose one of three entrees, either chicken, beef, or vegetables. So for your first selection, you're making your entree selection. And for your second selection, you are making a side selection. And you're only allowed one side, so nothing crazy here. So you're allowed to pick one entree and one side. Now again, this isn't always the case, right? Sometimes you can pick multiple sides, and if you're on a cruise ship, they might even let you have multiple entrees for free. You gotta watch out, take the stairs on those things. All right, so in this case, what do we do? To find out the num number of total possibilities, all right, is we say, well, we would say how many of each possible selection are there. For the entrees, so we said there were three, and for the sides, we said there were two. So three times two gives me six different ways we can make this selection. In other words, there would be six elements or points in my sample space. And on the next slide, we're gonna actually go into a visualization of those possibilities using something called a tree diagram, which can either be done horizontally or vertically, depending on your inclination. So again, multiply the number of possibilities together. In this case, they did not impact each other, so three times two is fine. But if we were talking about something like picking a card or picking something from a finite group of objects and we've removed one and there's one fewer now, you would have to make adjustments if they're dependent. Taking a look at our next slide, we see what I'm talking about here. The sample space was just the list of all possible outcomes for a sequence of events. So that's what we mean by sample space. Make sure that is in your notes so when they talk about it in the homework or on a test, you're not sitting there going, I don't know what that means. A sample space is the list, the list, so listing out all possible outcomes for your sequence of events. So one selection after another or one event after another. Now a tree diagram, it's not necessary, but a lot of people find them useful. So I would like to show you how they work. They are helpful ways to visualize the possible outcomes. In other words, ways that you can generate your sample space visually, okay? So here, for example, let's go back to that last, um, that last example where we had to make an entree selection and we say there were three possibilities, right? So I'm doing a nice tree diagram here with the uh, horizontal orientation. So the first option was chicken. The second option for another line here, beef. The third option with my vegetarian option, just vegetables as my entree, okay? Now, once you make that selection, you now have to make your side dish selection. So in the next situation here, now we're talking about our sides, aren't we? So we, once you made the chicken selection, we could have chicken with french fries, or we could have chicken with mashed potatoes. Remember, there were only two side options. Had there been more side options, we'd have more of these little um, stems or branches. What if you chose beef? Well, you could either have beef with french fries or beef with mashed potatoes, couldn't you? What if you chose vegetables? Well, you could have vegetables with french fries or vegetables with mashed potatoes. They didn't give us the option of no sides. If that had been an option, we would draw that extra branch, wouldn't we? So how did that help us besides visualizing it, right? Well, it helps me because now I can write out the elements of what we call our sample space. So how do I do that here? Well, I would say I could have chicken with french fries. So that would be, I'll use the letter C for chicken if you don't mind, C, F. Traditionally, the way we do this is we use a capital letter for each of the possibilities. So C for chicken, F for french fries. So CF tells the audience or tells the reader that they've chosen chicken and then they've chosen french fries. What's another opportunity here? Well, chicken with 
M for mashed potatoes, or you could have chosen P for potatoes, I suppose. What about B? B for beef and F for french fries. How about B for beef and M for mashed potatoes? How about V for vegetables with F for french fries? And how about V for vegetables with M for mashed potatoes? Here we have our six, notice that there are six of them here, our six points in our sample space. Chicken with french fries, chicken with mashed potatoes, beef with french fries, beef with mashed potatoes, vegetables with french fries, and vegetables with mashed potatoes. Does it make sense that there are six points in the sample space based on the FCP, the fundamental counting principle, on the previous slide? Yes, because there were three possible entrees, two possible sides, and we made one of each choice. So three times two is six, and that is where we got the six from. Okay, I have also embedded in your notes, if you look at your interactive slides, I have embedded another video which goes through constructing tree, tree diagrams using the same approach, but if you want an extra layer, layer of explanation and interactive um, examples, I would check that out. Okay, you see a little bit of it on this slide here. Heading to my next slide, let's put this into use, shall we? Example one, suppose we take a coin, and it's a fair coin with the heads and the tails, right? And we flip it, but we don't just flip it one time, we actually take another coin next to it and flip that coin. And we take another coin next to it and we flip that coin. Now it could be, excuse me, <coughs> it could be that we flip three independent coins, right? It could also be that we flip the same coin three times. That would not make a difference here because a coin flip is independent, right? So we know that there are three flips that happen. Determine the number of points in the sample space. Now how do we do that? Number of points in a sample space? That would be what we call the fundamental counting principle. Some textbooks call this the fundamental counting rule. It's the same thing, the FCP or the FCR, which really just means multiply, okay? If you're trying to remember, what is FCP? Multiply the number of se selections that are possible for each choice. Okay, then once you know the number of them that we're looking for, then they would like us to build a tree diagram to actually list all of those possible outcomes in the sample space. And finally, once we have that, we can use what we have to find these probabilities, can't we? So let's take a look at what we're told here. We're told we are flipping a coin. So if we're flipping a coin, our, let's talk about our first flip. Our first flip, I'm gonna do it horizontally for the sake of this slide, but feel free to do it vertically if you prefer. You're used to seeing vertically, for example, for like a family, um, family tree, which is nice vertical. They start with their patriarchs, matriarchs on top, and then they go down from there, each generation. But feel free to do it either way. So for my first flip, how many options do I have for my first coin? Yep, that's right, I have a heads, and I have a tails. Now some people will use different colors for each different possibility. If that's helpful to you, please feel free to do so. Also note that if you draw them a little skinnier, you can actually fit more space. So I'm gonna go ahead and readjust this scenario so that I have room to build out. So I'm gonna actually do it like this. So heads or tails for my first flip. Now I go to my second flip, and I'm gonna use a different color for that. Again, you can color coordinate this as you like. So for my second flip now, let's say I had gotten a heads for my first flip. Now I flip it again, and I could either get a heads or I could get a tails. What if I had gotten a tails for my first flip? Well, I could flip it again and get a heads or I could get a tails, that's right. And now I have one final flip of a coin. Let me find another color I haven't played with yet. I think you can see this color. Let me see if that's true. Yeah, you can see this one pretty good, I think. For my third flip, after that last one, I could, from this head, I could get a head or a tails again. And from this tail, I could get a head or a tail. You kind of get the pattern here. And from this flip, I could get a head or a tail. And from this flip, I could get a head or I could get a tail. Okay, got a little cluttered there at the end. Let me move my third so you can kind of see that better. So this is the third flip. Okay, so what we have here is we've listed out a tree diagram that will hopefully inform us to find our sample space, okay? We also were told, though, to calculate the number of points in the sample space. And how could I have done that? I could have said my first selection, or in this case, my first event was a flip, my first flip, then my second flip of a coin, and then my third flip of a coin. And how many possible ways are there when you flip a fair coin? Just two, two times two times two. Notice they are independent, so they did not impact one another, but had these been selections from a finite group, they might have impacted the total, so keep that in mind. Well, two times two times two is four times two, or four times two is eight, right? So there are eight total ways that this could happen. In other words, there should be eight points in the sample space. Let's see if that is correct. Let's see if we can deduce our sample space 
from this tree diagram that we just constructed. So what would the sample space be? Well, let's take a look at each of these outcomes. Let me grab another color for us. What if we had heads the first time, heads the second time, and heads the third time? If you're doing this on a piece of paper, I highly recommend using highlighters or different colored pens to mark off which ones you've already done, okay? So one opportunity here is that we had heads, heads, and then heads. What is another possible point in our sample space? How about heads followed by heads followed by tails? H, H, and then T. Or heads, tails, heads. Or heads, tails, tails. Now I've listed half of them, right? Because there's eight. That's why we want to know how many there are so we can make sure we have talked about them all. Next up, what if instead of heads first, I got a tails and then a heads and then a heads? T, H, H. Or what if I got tails, heads, tails? T, H, T. Or what if I got tails, tails, heads? T, T, H. Or how about tails, tails, tails? T, T, T. Okay. Have we listed eight unique possibilities? Yes, we have. Once we have, we can then, once we have our sample space, we can then answer any of these questions below. From these eight possible outcomes, when you flip a coin three times, right, and again, we could have done the same thing rolling a die, there would be six possibilities for each time instead of two, though, so that would be a little bit bigger of a tree diagram, right, one through six for each new roll, okay? But when you flip a die, there's only two possible outcomes for each flip, so that's why we did uh, two branches off of each choice or each roll, flip in this case rather. So what is the probability that you're talking about one of these situations, right, and we get a situation where there were no heads. So you've rolled a die, I keep saying roll a die, I apologize, you've flipped a coin three times. Whether they're three unique coins or the same coin, it doesn't matter because they're independent. You flip this coin three times, what is the probability of getting no heads? Can that happen? Yes. In which case did that happen? right here, one time out of eight. So if you said one out of eight, you'd be correct. Now roughly as a percentage, that's about 12 and a half percent. You can check that in your calculator, okay? On the other hand, the next one says, find the probability that we would get exactly one head when you flip a coin three times in a row. Exactly one head. Well, wh where does that happen? Do you see exactly one head anywhere? Well, that would mean we only have the letter H happening one time. So that can't be the first case, because that's three H's. It can't be the second, third, or fourth case, because those have a couple of H's. And it can't be the next, the fifth, or the, yeah, the fifth case. But it can be the sixth or the seventh case, can't it? Notice in the sixth case, we have one head in the middle. In the seventh case, we have one head at the end, okay? And did we ever have the case where we had the head at the beginning? Oh, there it is. I missed it. Okay. So there are three cases where there is exactly, that word exactly is important here, there are three cases when there are exactly one head out of the eight possible points in the sample space. So the answer there should be three out of eight, if I'm looking at it correctly. Three out of eight. So let me just double check one more time. We had three heads, we had two heads, one head. Yes, it does look like three out of eight. Okay. If I made a mistake, you'll have to forgive me and let me know. All right. What is the probability of getting all heads? All heads. Well, that happens once, doesn't it? Right here. Once out of the eight times. So that would be one out of eight. Nice. And now this is another one that we've seen before. Maybe you can try it on your own and see if you remember. What is the probability of getting at least one head? At least one head. What does that mean again? One or more? So you could say that's one head or two head or three head and add them all up. You could also remember the formula. At least one, the probability of at least one is always one minus the probability of none. In this case, no heads. That's what none would mean, right? So we know the probability of no heads, don't we? We did that earlier. That was one eighth. So couldn't we just do one minus one eighth, which gives us seven eighths as our answer, which is a pretty big percentage, right? 87 and a half percent. Or if you prefer, you could have counted up all the times where you have one or more heads, right? And you would see that happens every case except for the case where there are always tails, right? So that's seven times out of eight. Okay, so we've done now an example with a tree diagram. It wasn't the biggest tree diagram, but it's just enough for a first example where it might be a little confusing. So be sure you can understand this one before you go to more complicated ones. Example two says that a couple plans to have four children. Determine the number of possible arrangements of boys and girls and the list and then list the sample space in order to find these probabilities. Okay, 
So in this case, we're not flipping a coin, although it's a very similar tree diagram here. I want you to see if you can build yourself a tree diagram just like we did in the last example. Now you might be thinking, do I really need a tree diagram, Professor? I think I can just list the sample space myself. Okay, I'm not going to necessarily always make you use a tree diagram, but I will tell you they are a great way to keep yourself organized so that you don't miss any of the possible outcomes. Okay, so the first thing I would do personally is figure out what I'm doing here, right? I'm having four children that we're planning on, so the first child, we're having a second child, we're having a third child, and we're having a fourth child. So according to the fundamental counting principle, to figure out the number of points in the sample space, we need to multiply the number of possibilities for each selection together. So since we're talking about a boy or a girl, that's two choices, so two times two times two times two. Okay, so if that's how we're understanding the concept here, that would be the setup. Two to the fourth power is really 16. So there are 16 ways that this can happen. Okay, now what do I mean by that? I mean the order in which you have the children, right? Are they all gonna be boys in a row? Or are they gonna be a mixture? Or are they all gonna be girls? We're gonna find out. Okay, so the way we would do this is we begin with our tree diagram. And again, start small and work your way up. For your first child, you could either have the girl or you could have the boy. Again, how you start it, how you label it is up to you. And then for your next child, I'll get another, another color here for your second choice here. You could have a girl or a boy again for each of those. And then for your third child, same thing again. You could have a girl or a boy for each one of those. It's getting a little hard to read, so hopefully you have a bigger piece of paper when you're in landscape mode here. And then finally for your fourth child, let's pick another color, how about orange? For your fourth child, same thing. You're gonna have GB coming off of each of these or BG, however you chose to write it. I'm just gonna write them first and then I'll <laughs> make my tree easier. So in the end, how many should there be? There should be 16. So there's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. I clearly need more room. Let's make some more room. There's my 14 and there's my 16. So you'd have to have all of your branches going to each of these possibilities. I think I have one too many. Okay. So once you've listed them all, hopefully you have listed them perfectly, not like I messed up here, what you would want to do next is actually write down your sample space. That's the important part. So if the tree diagram is more of a hassle for you, if that's not actually helping you get a visualization of what's happening, then don't go ahead and go through that trouble, but make sure that you can talk about the 16 possibilities correctly. So let's see if we can figure those out, whether or not you use the tree diagram or not. So one thing I could do, again, I'll get another color here. How about red? Okay. I could notice, well, there's the possibility where you have the four the same, right? And one thing you can do if you're clever is you could do this for both genders, right? You could say girl, 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 girl. And then on the other side here, you could also say the opposite of that, right? Would be boy, 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 right? Having all boys, okay? So you can kind of save yourself time if these are only one or the other kind of situations. So that is this scenario down here, okay? You could have girl, 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 boy. So girl, 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 boy. And then I could do the opposite of that if I'm trying to save time because these are, again, opposite scenarios. That would be B, 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 G. I could have, looking at my tree diagram at the beginning here, girl, girl, boy, girl. So G, G, B, G. I could have girl, girl, boy, boy. So G, G, B, B. And again, you can take the opposites if you, if you prefer to do it that way at the same time. I could have girl, boy, girl, 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 boy, girl, girl, right? I could have girl, boy, girl, boy. So the mix, G, B, G, B. Now here, since there are 16 possibilities, I need there to be eight of each column, and I am kind of running out of space, but we shall see how we can do this. Okay, so we'll continue. The next one would be GB, we did GB, GB. How about GB, BG? Come over here, GB, let me look at that right, GB, BG. And then the next one could be GB, BB. Okay, and now I think I've, I've come up with the eight unique starting with G, right? So you can make sure I have those there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Once you have those, you can simply take the opposite since these are either or, right? 
this is kind of an easy situation that way. So I'm going to take the opposites of all of these ones here. So instead of girl, girl, boy, girl, let's have boy, boy, girl, boy. Instead of GGBB, I'll do BBGG. Instead of girl, boy, girl, girl, I'm going to do boy, girl, boy, boy. And then here I'm taking the opposite of GBGB. So this would be uh, BGBG. Instead of GBBG, I'll do G, let me see, I said that wrong. I'll do BGGB, BGGB. And instead of GBBB, I'll do BGGG, okay. And you can check me. I am not perfect as we are all humans. So if I made a mistake here, I apologize, but I think I have all 16 there by taking um, the first grouping following the G trajectory of my tree diagram and then taking the opposites because it's either or in this case. Once you have listed all 16 possibilities, again, either by simply following the tree diagram very carefully, methodically, or by thinking through how many types of ways I could do this, four at a time, three at a time, two at a time, et cetera, you should come up with your 16 unique possibilities. Now, that's the hardest part. Once you've done that correctly, we can answer these questions. So we have those 16 possibilities. What is the probability of this situation? That we would have a girl followed by a boy. Now, it doesn't say where that happens. It just means that we want G before B in one of these scenarios, G before B. Well, let's see if that happens here. I see G before B. That happens in the third case as well. G before B happens in the fourth case. G before B happens in the fifth case. G before B happens in the sixth case. Uh, does not happen there, does not happen there, but it happens here with B, B, G, B. Uh, G before B does not happen here, but it does happen here with B, G, B, B. G before B happens with G, B, B, G, and with B, G, B, G, and with G, B, 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 and with B, G, G, B, and but does not happen with B, G, G, G. Let's count how many times that was. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, out of the possible 16. So 11 out of 16, or the approximately 69%. Let's look at the next situation they ask about. What's the probability of having exactly, remember that word means something, so that number, no more, no less. Exactly two girls. So that's not going to be GGGG, right? It's not going to be any time when we have three girls, or one girl, or four girls. It's exactly two. So when does that happen? I'm not seeing it quite yet, but I am seeing it here, GGBB. I'm not seeing it again in that column. I'm not seeing it until I get to BBGG, and then again here with GBBG, and BGBG, and then I'm not seeing it until I get to BGGB. That's one, two, three, four, is that five? Let me see, I didn't miss any. I felt like there was another one. We should have exactly two girls. So I miss any here at all. Three there, three there, three there. I think I missed one here. GBGB, so there should be six if I counted correctly. So six out of 16, which does reduce as a fraction to 3 eighths or roughly 38%. Okay. Finally, for our last one here, remember that the probability of at least one, at least one girl in this case, is the same as one minus the probability of none, which in this case would mean no girls. Otherwise, you have to add up the number of times where you have one girl or two girls or three girls or four girls, which is a lot of addition. So the only time I have no girls is this case, right, where we have all boys. And that happens one time out of the 16. So this would be 1 minus 1 out of 16. In other words, we should be saying 15 out of the 16 times we are getting at least one girl, which is roughly 94%. Okay. So now we've done another example where we built a tree diagram to give us our, our sample space. From the sample space, after we did all that work, we were then able to analyze each situation to answer the probability questions. But what if you don't need the tree diagram? Let's look at our last example. So in this last example, we're talking about something that maybe you as a student have encountered, where you're trying to pick your classes for a semester or a quarter, okay? And you're told that you must pick one class from each of the, these disciplines. And again, I've made up a scenario that might not be completely like yours, but bear with me. You're told you must pick one math class, and then I've listed four different math classes here. The first one is, if you can't see it, MAC 1105, which is our college algebra, and then MGF 1106, which is this class, our liberal arts type of class, MGF 1107, another type of liberal arts class, and then STA 2023, that's like our statistics class. So you have to pick one from what we call our math section. There's other math classes, but maybe this is what they've told you you have to choose from. Maybe this is what you're qualified to take. 
Then they say you need to also take one from the communications department. And the options that they give you are ENC 1101, which is our Comp 1 class here, ENC 1102, our Comp 2 class, SPC 1600, maybe that's our speech class. And then they also tell you you need to take one of the social sciences and they give you a list of options. And maybe they say you can take psychology, which is here S P PSY, I think 1600, or a sociology class, SOC 1000, or a humanities class, HUM 2300, or a world history class, WOH 1030, or a logic or philosophy class, I think that's what this is, PHI 2600, let's say. Just helping you read it better, okay. Now that you have those possible scenarios, they would like you to determine the following. First of all, what is the total number of possible course schedules? If you're like me, when I was a student, I'd actually list them all out, and then I'd pick the best one for my class schedule, right? What times I liked best. But here, they're actually saying, how many ways could you do this, right? Well, if you remember the fundamental counting principle, which just means multiply the number of possibilities for each election together, we can do this. So for math, how many possibilities are there? And then for communications, how many possibilities are there? And then for social sciences, how many possibilities are there? Multiply those together. Again, we're only choosing one from each category. If you were making multiple selections, that would impact your next choice, wouldn't it? So if you're only choosing one of the math classes, how many possibilities were there? Four. Nice job. If you're choosing one of the communications classes from this list, there's three choices. And they, then, of course, there are five choices of the social sciences. So when you multiply 4 times 3 times 5, that's 12 times 5, or 60 ways we could do this. In other words, the fancy way you would say this is there are 60 points in the sample space. Would you want to draw that tree diagram? Oh my goodness, you saw how it got complicated in just the last slide, and we had 16 possible ways of having four kids, right? So 60 ways, there are a whole lot of branches you would have to make. So I'm not going to make you do it right now, because that's a big, big tree diagram. But I am going to have you use what you know about the FCP to answer this question. How, what, how would you figure this one out? Probability that your schedule ends up including statistics, or STA 2023. Well, let's think about that, okay? To figure out the probability of something, we typically write the total number of ways in our denominator. Well, we know there are 60 ways that we could choose a class schedule, right? There are 60 ways we could choose our class schedule. We know that our class schedule has to have three things in it, right? It has to have a math class, it has to have a communications class, and it has to have a social science, okay? So if we're told that we, we want to have statistics in our course schedule, then how many choices do we really have when picking a math class? So if someone says, you have to take statistics, well, that leaves me with one choice for math. But I still have flexibility in my communications, I can choose three options, or in my social sciences, I can choose five options. So once you've narrowed down your math course, that really leaves you with 15 of the 60 possible schedules, right? So 15 out of 60, that's the likelihood that your schedule will include statistics in it, okay? Which does reduce, 15 out of 60 comes down just to 1 over 4 or 25% chance. Now you might think, well, that's obvious, right? That was one of the four math courses, so of course there's a 25% chance. But they're not always going to be that obvious, okay? But what did I do? I had my denominator, which was my total number of possible schedules. And in my numerator, I knew that for every category, I had a certain number of possibilities. The only one that had shifted here was the math, because math was chosen for me as statistics. With that in mind, can you do C on your own? Let's see how you did. It says find the probability that your schedule would end up including MAC 1105, so it's our college algebra class, and ENC 11101, or Comp 1. So you want to have both of those in your schedule. Well, we know there's 60 possible schedules. We've already figured that out at the beginning, so that's our denominator. We know for math here, we'd only have one choice since we're taking college algebra, or MAC 1105. For communications, we only have one choice because we're, we're told to take Comp 1, so that brings that to 1. But for our social sciences, we still had the five choices, right? 1 times 1 times 5 makes our numerator 5, and our denominator stays 60. Well, that reduces to a nice fraction of 1 out of 12, 1 out of 12, which as a decimal is 0.283 roughly, or about 28.3% chance of taking both of those classes together. So not highly likely that you end up with both of those classes together, but it definitely is a decent probability. Okay, so this was an example where we didn't quite draw the whole tree diagram, but we used the idea of figuring out the number of points in the sample space along with how many possibilities are there for each selection. Multiply it together using the FCP, and we get our results shortly thereafter. Well, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, happy practicing, because math is not a spectator sport. I'll see you next time.